Okay. I wonder if I can call this meeting to order and welcome you to this announced meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? The first item of business today is to consider whether to take item five, consideration of our draft annual report in private. Do members agree to take item five in private? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. If we can then move on to agenda item two, new petitions. Um, the first petition for consideration this morning is a new petition on action against irresponsible dog breeding, which was lodged by Eileen Bryant. Members have a copy of the petition, a note by the clerk and the spice briefing. And can I welcome Emma Harper, MSP, to the meeting for this item. First of all, the petition will give evidence in the petition and is accompanied by Mark Rafferty, the Chief Inspector um, with the Special Investigations Unit of the SSPCA. Can I thank you very much for attending this morning. You have an opportunity to provide a brief opening statement of up to five minutes, after which we will take the opportunity to ask some questions from committee members. So if I can ask you to um, make your statement. Thank you. Um, I'm here because I represent a pressure group that was formed in response to the BBC's Panorama programme exposing the puppy farmers. I've been privileged to have dogs of varying sizes and breeds as part of my family all my life, and the horrors that I saw in that programme spurred me on to be a voice for those defenceless creatures. As a nation, we welcome dogs into our homes. They become a family member, and we trust our children with them. They're domestic animals. They're not commercially bred farm animals for the food chain. There are a reason for that. All dogs are 99% wolf, they say. And if there's anything I know about wolves, it's that they are a strong family animal. They create a family structure. They socialise and engage with each other. A puppy from a puppy farm never has that opportunity. It is bred in isolation from human contact. Its own mother never has time to instil a place in the pack into that baby before it's whipped away from her. And she's returned to the living hell that she endures. That pup is sold on, usually far too young, no socialisation, very often into a family with children. Apart from the hell the pup might suffer from illness, etc., it's now in a position of trust in a family. No idea how to behave. That, fa that animal can become a burden on the family, paying heavy vet fees and perhaps now being cross with children and, if it's lucky, ending up in a rescue. It's obvious that there is no easy answer to dealing with puppy farmers or the puppy dealers that form the other part of the equation. When I ask the Scottish Government to look at irresponsible breeding, I'm asking them first to investigate what actions could be taken to put a robust licensing system in place. I'm asking them to look at the rules around licensed breeders. How do you know what it is that they are actually breeding? How do you decide how many breeding bitches they should have? How do you control how many litters each bitch has? What is to stop the bitch being injected with hormones to bring her straight back into season after the litter she is feeding right now is taken away from her? What could be put in place to stop this cruelty? How is best practice addressed? And what about the rescue centres that some of these pups end up in? How do you licence them? Yesterday on Facebook there was a litter in Kirkubri advertised on a site called Dumfries and Galloway Pets for Sale. Cocker Pugs, right? That's a cross uh, with a Cocker Spaniel and a pug. £500 each, eight puppies, a nice £4,000, thank you. When I suggested to them that would be handy for the summer holidays, they blocked me. Surprise, surprise. These are two breeds with serious genetic faults and apart from the absolute cruelty involved in this breeding, think of the possible vet bills for some family or will these puppies just end up in rescue situations too? How does the government enlist the help of the experts, the kennel club, to stop this crossbreeding? How do we maybe make vets take some responsibility to monitor these situations? I tackled another woman about a cockapoo. That's a, a cocker spaniel and a poodle. She told me it was well-bred. It was an F1. Now, I do a bit of gardening, and the only F1 I've come across is usually a cucumber plant. This, of course, highlights the huge problem of the backstreet breeders out to make money from a few lit litters every year. 
To get back to healthy breeding, what actions could the government be taking to ensure there are fit and proper persons being granted a licence? What conditions could be attached to licences to ensure best practice and who is going to police this? Should it be compulsory for breeds that have known genetic faults to undergo a screening before they're allowed to breed? In Dumfries and Galloway, we have formed a great relationship with Trading Standards and combined with the SSP, there is some great and groundbreaking work being carried out. And I'm sure you'll be answered fully on any questions you might have about that by Mark here from the SSPCA. But this is not the case all over Scotland. And what regards could be given to ensure all councils behave the same way? There is no use in a law or best practice happening in Dumfries and Galloway if the same rules don't apply in all 32 local authorities. There are other issues around licensing to be considered, and that's microchipping. What information should a microchip contain? Should it be a direct line to the breeder? Should the microchip contain information on lineage and health reports? Who should be allowed to microchip, and to what database should the information go on to? At the moment, anyone can take a course on microchipping and there seems to be no regulation regarding where that information is stored. Again, the joys of social media. There is a woman on the same site I spoke about earlier offering cheap chipping. What is the value of this chipping if it is so unregulated? I now come to the illegal importation of dogs. We are seeing the farmed puppies coming in through the ferry ports saying they are coming from Northern Ireland, when in actual fact they're coming from the Republic of Ireland. How is the Scottish Government going to deal with this? What actions are they going to take? A pup from the Republic of Ireland has to carry a pet passport, a microchip, be inoculated against rabies, and in actual fact cannot travel legally because of the inoculation situation until it is 15 weeks old. A pup from Northern Ireland, apart from the microchipping, does not have any of these restrictions, how is this going to be stopped? We've been working closely with our opposite numbers in Ulster and Ireland, and I'm sure that Mark again will answer questions about the success of Operation Delphin. Puppies are big business, and we know organised crimes see this as a great money-making venture, and these people have no worries about animal welfare. So all efforts to disrupt the importation of these pups is difficult. And in fact, lately we hear about various other ways, apart from the ferries, of bringing them into the country, trying to beat the system. Lastly, I want to address the issue of education. Until we can cut off the demand for puppies, there will always be some people willing to risk anything for the large rewards. How is the Scottish Government going to address the issue of education? Should there be a media campaign? Should there be a long-term campaign through the schools? I know that research work has been carried out at the moment to look at the psychology involved when buying a pup. Perhaps that work will give solutions for the government to consider re-educating people on how to buy a puppy. Looking at making sure you see the pup's mum, not meeting the seller in a car park anywhere, the list goes on and on. But what resources are needed to carry out an education problem, uh, program? Should it be included in the school curriculum? The way forward for the long term, in my opinion, has to be with education and coordinated nationwide approach to registering appropriate breeders and enforceable le legislation to ensure this happens. Thank you for your time. I'm ha happy to answer any questions. And I'm sure you'll have plenty for Mark Rafferty from the SSPCA. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think that's a very helpful um, opening statement on, on many of the issues. In fact, the, the one I want to start off with maybe will be for Mark to answer, because I think it would be helpful to start with Operation Delphin. And I wonder if you can explain for the record what Operation Delphin is, when it commenced, and where it stands at the moment. Yes, good morning. Uh, Operation Delphin uh, was the brainchild of the Scottish SPCA, primarily uh, in response to welfare complaints in relation to pups that had been purchased by consumers in Scotland and then quickly became unwell and many of them died. 
Uh, we looked at the puppy trade, in particular the import of pups into Scotland, uh, and were able to establish that the, the, there was two main areas uh, where pups are entering in Scotland. One was from Ireland and one was from Europe. Uh, Operation Delphin then linked up with the various other animal welfare charities in the UK and in Southern Ireland. Southern Ireland. That's the RSPCA, the USPCA in Northern Ireland, the DSPCA, who are the Dublin SPCA, and the ISPCA to, co to collaboratively work and assess the problem which was affecting each country. And, there is a, and what was agreed was there is a problem, a similar problem affecting each country, but quite differently in each country. What has been established at, uh, is that, that Scotland doesn't have the breeding establishments on a scale that Southern Ireland, and to a lesser degree, that Northern Ireland has. Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland have huge establishments, some of them licensed and some of them unlicensed. Some of them have as much as a thousand breeding bitches in cattle sheds. These bitches are treated as agricultural animals and we've spoke to vets who've been treating these animals and, and, and trying to establish a regime to ensure the welfare of the breeding bitches as well as the pups. What happens in any regime where we have intensive rearing of animals is there's an increase or a, an increased likelihood of disease, uh, parasites, and, and that then gets passed over in the pups to the consumer who then has to deal with pups that become unwell and often die. The, the common uh, diseases and conditions are parvovirus, Giardia, Campylobacter, and all, all these are very serious conditions that can quickly affect fragile little pups. So the welfare organisations under the auspice of Operation Delphin came together approximately five years ago and the primary role or, or goal was to disrupt and detect unlicensed breeders, unlicensed traders in the hope that we can improve the welfare of the pups and the bitches. So th that is uh, the, 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 the role of Operation Delphin. Since then, we now have got Police Scotland involved, various police forces in England and Wales. We've got the Ports Police at Cairn Ryan. And we also have a, a, a particular relationship with Dumfries and Galloway Council, who, uh, who identified a, a, a particular difficulty in relation to enforcement. And to overcome that, they authorised the SSPCA to enforce the regulations in relation to the import-export of pups into Scotland because of the difficulties that they had. And basically, people that are tra trading in these dogs are coming across at three o'clock in the morning on ferries that, to avoid detection. So the council had difficulty resourcing that, and we are now working with the council under their umbrella to enforce that uh, area. And, and I would think that going to these meetings uh, in the UK and Southern Ireland, to a certain degree, Scotland is ahead of the game on this. We've got still a long way to go. We're assessing the problem and we are making uh, inroads and we're having a positive effect on reducing and disrupting the trade, but there's still a long way to go. That's very helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. Um, I'd like to explore the issue around licensing of breeding. Our briefing material in your petition indicates that puppy farms are not necessarily unlicensed or illegal. Is it your understanding that licenses are only needed for what are called breeding establishments and that these are establishments that produce five or more litters in a year? Yes, that's, that's a really interesting uh, question. The, the, there is two main licenses. One is a breeding license, and that restricts how many bitches you have and how many pups you can breed in a year. That, that doesn't seem to be the particular problem in Scotland, or, or the main problem. The main problem appears to be dealers. Now, dealers require a dealer's licence or a pet shop licence because, in effect, they're operating as a pet shop. They don't have the, uh, the breeding bitches and they don't have the, 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 the fathers or the pups. So they go, they source their dogs, their puppies, from breeders and then they deal with these, these pups. Councils then issue licences, either breeders' licences, and the difficulty in relation to breeders' licences 
actually quantifying how many breeding bitches they have because the people are entitled to have so many breeding bitches once the license is granted following up that license check seems to be uh, inconsistent to say the least so people start off with five breeding bitches uh, or six breeding bitches and then soon they can have 20 breeding bitches and there's very little checks to done to regulate that in terms, so even if they do have a license, and one of the difficulties of the license is a person that is breaching that license, once the council have granted that license, they can't revoke that license. It's only a sheriff that can revoke that license, so it has to go to sheriff court, having as part of a, a criminal case for a sheriff then to decide to revoke that license. So councils give a license, but they're unable to revoke it. Okay, thank you. If I can. In fact, I'd okay, be okay with you to stick with the idea of licensing. And in the background information to the petition, you offer some suggestions, including the creation of a unique breeder number for every legitimate dog breeder. Can you give an idea of how this system might work in practice? Uh, for example, who would be responsible uh, for operating and monitoring such a system? And how would you define a legitimate uh, dog breeder? Yes, I, I think the licensing system is not individual to puppy breeders. That, you know, that licensing is done throughout Scotland for vast many reasons, the licensed liquor trade. And, and I, would, I would suggest that, it, that it, it's, it remains with the council. But in terms of funding the, 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 that licensing, there has to be a system in place to create some funding so that the council are able to enforce and inspect and regulate the licensing better than they are at the moment. Some councils charge very little for a license, some charge a little bit more. I would suggest that there should be more thought towards having a realistic license charge that would then fund the regulation and inspections that are required. Sorry, sorry okay, just, just at the back end of that question was, you know, I, I, how you define a legitimate dog breeder? Legitimate dog breeders would have to apply for their licence and then stand up to the rigours of inspection by the council, just the same if, if, if you were applying for a licence for, uh, for another issue. So you wouldn't need to be deemed a fit and proper person by the local council and your establishment would have to be inspected as to be suitable uh, in terms of what you are proposing, if you're going to have two dogs or you're going to have five dogs. So I think that the... the, the the councils would need to uh, do more regulation and more inspection uh, to have a realistic idea of, of how these people were trading because at the moment licences are issued and I think in some occasions there's very little inspection, if any, done in relation to the activities of that person trading under the licence. That's a licence trade. Obviously there's the unlicensed trade as well. Uh, I appreciate that's a different matter, but there's a vast amount of people out there because of the low penalties that are associated with breaching a licence mm. or trading with a licence are prepared to take the risk of trading without a licence as opposed to going through the rigours of getting a licence. So I, I, I'd like to make it clear that Scottish SPC are not against dog breeding or the selling of dogs. It's a responsible breeding with en ensuring the welfare of the dogs that the Scottish SPC are looking to improve. So uh, th this may actually be a, a, a debate about how we can increase dog responsible puppy breeding as opposed to restricting puppy breeding. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Rona Mackay. Thank you. Good, good morning, Eileen. Good morning, Mark. Um, my question sort of follows on from Brian Whittles in a way, um, but I'm interested in getting a sense of the demand that exists for, for uh, puppies. Uh, the briefing we have um, refers to an RSPCA report called Sold a Pup, which estimated UK demand for puppies to be between 700,000 and 1.9 million a year. Battersea Dogs and Cats Home estimated that just under 70,000 of these are bred by licensed breeders. The rest will have come from a number of other sources, including small-scale breeders who produce fewer than five litters per year and don't require a licence, as you've just been um, outlining. Um, however, it will also include illegal and unlicensed breeders and imports from elsewhere in Europe. Um, the RSPCA estimates that around half the puppies in the British marketplace could come from unlicensed breeders. Are there any estimates that you could give us um, as an idea of the numbers in Scotland specifically? It's a really difficult question to, uh, or, or thing to quantify. What, what I can say, and which may help you, is that there appears to be, at the moment, 
There has always been a demand for pups, and people will always want to have a puppy within their family, and they should be entitled to have a, a puppy. But at the moment, there seems to be an un unquenchable appetite by the public for some particular breeds of dogs, which are either defined as new breeds or designer breeds. Uh, and, and it's a question of su supply and demand. If you look yourself at the internet in Scotland and look at the advertising platforms in Scotland, you can see that the prices that these pups, that are crossbreed pups, uh, are commanding. A thousand pound is probably an average of, of, of what these pups are, are, are demanding. So I would say in terms of how many pups, unfortunately, I can't give you a number, but it is definitely... The other issue is we live in a culture that is increasingly a consumer culture where... Items, including animals and pups, are looked at as commodities, mm -hmm. uh, and these are throwaway commodities and for, for some people. So they buy a pup on the Saturday, mm -hmm. a month down the line, they no longer want it, and they hand it. And we are getting these designer breeds handed into our rescue shel shelters mm -hmm. because people no longer want them, they don't fit in with a the lifestyle, they've not planned it properly. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, um, unfortunately, I can't give you a number, but it is, it is a very serious and significant amount of animals that are coming in, into it's, it's Scotland. It's almost like they're, they're fashion, it's a trend at the time, and then that will demand that will take the demand at that time. Yes, and, and, if, and I think that, that, that fashion has perhaps been promoted by celebrity and within the media. If you look sure. at the media yourself on television, mm -hmm. these little designer handbag dogs are, you know, are extremely popular, and that obviously has a knock-on effect to, to, to consumers. Thank you. Sorry, Convener, I should have declared an interest as a member of the cross-party group on animal welfare. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Corey. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you mentioned the public's desire for designer puppies. Uh, is this something that you, Mr Rafferty, believe is having a significant impact in driving demand and potentially leading to an increase in unlicensed breeding? Yes, I think it is. And, and the issue, one of the issues with these particular designer breeds or new breeds or cross breeds is that there is no breed standard. What does a cava pug look like? What is the breed standard? There is no breed standard. So when you get so what you what you're getting is you're irresponsible or, or, or downright deceitful breeding uh, of of adult dogs that are producing pups that that actually don't fit the breed standard because there is no breed standard. So that there is a kind of cavalier or irresponsible approach by the breeders to the, the puppies or the item or, the, or the, the, the product that they're producing. And that has not only is it in the, the, the physical uh, aspects of the dog, but also there's little regard given to the temperament or behavior or socialization of these pups. So we've got dogs that one are not being bred particularly well in the first instance and got congenital defect or inherited health problems, but also you've got behavioural problems or socialisation problems that often stay with a dog throughout its entire life. So, and I think that's having an effect on the population of dogs in Scotland as a whole, as a negative effect on, on uh, dogs in Scotland as a whole. Can I also supplemental that? Thanks, Trina. Um, is there any area in Scotland, other particular areas of Scotland that there's significant uh, emphasis of this, uh, you know, sort of um, instances of this in designer dog breeding? At the consumer end, it's all the major cities that, that are buying these dogs. And, and th as I've said, thankfully, we don't have puppy... F Scotland does not have puppy farms on the scale that Southern Ireland or Northern Ireland has. We don't have uh, institutions where there's hundreds and hundreds or a thousand breeding bitches. Councils, thankfully, have taken a different approach and have regulated that. That's one of the positives uh, with the council. Unfortunately... The other side, because of this inconsistency within the council, there's very little regulation done at the consumer at the sales end. So, pe so, so people that are selling unlicensed or, or, or breaching the license, there's very little enforcement being done by the councils uh, in that respect. It, we, we're encouraging councils to, when they're considering licenses, to speak to the organisations that can give them uh, information that would assist in that their decisions about granting licenses and that is obviously uh, uh, ourselves because we often are, are at the forefront of when someone buys a pup it becomes unwell and dies and they tell us it comes from a particular person we're uh, uh, we're, uh, uh, we're able to give that information to the councils and they can then make 
a, a decision based on this information. And many of the councils are beginning to, to buy into that now. So hopefully that should have a, a positive approach going forward in terms of what licences that, 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 that they wish to grant. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. MacDonald. Thanks, Convener. Um, just following up on the issue of, of local authorities, you mentioned in your opening statement uh, that, um, or to paraphrase, there are different levels of, of commitment to address the issue, um, and that isn't satisfactory. Um, there must be a clearer implementation throughout the country. Now, you've identified a range of agencies that have been involved in, in work on this issue, and it appears from the briefing that we've received from uh, uh, SPICE that that they're responsible for enforcement of the various regulations associated with uh, importing pet dogs and certain other animals. Um, could you clarify whether local authorities have been included in these agencies? Yes, we have. We have had local authority representation through the trading standards. Uh, Dumfries and Galloway trading standards have played quite a, a large part in our meetings um, and we're able to discuss with them you know, various situations that happen. They've been very cooperative. OK, that's, yeah. that's good to hear. Um, I have to say, uh, convener, I, I saw it firsthand uh, when I was on Falkirk Council's planning committee uh, a number of years ago when we had to uh, deal with an issue of an unlicensed uh, puppy farm. Um, and to say the conditions were shocking uh, was uh, a, a, a certainly an understatement. Um, and it's probably fair to say that council officers could have done with greater enforcement powers uh, at that time, um, given that they were uh, dealing with uh, a well-known gangster um, on that occasion, and if no qualms in, in using that word uh, publicly. Um, so clearly, um, it's good to hear that local authorities are on board and uh, addressing the issue of enforcement. Thank you. Uh, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, really just following on again from, from Angus's question about enforcement, um, do, can you say, you know, what particular barriers there might be to, to ensuring enforcement efforts are, are effective? One of the barriers is, the, the, uh, historically, the, the lack of uh, joint working or collaborative working between the various organisations. Mm -hmm. And I would say I don't think there's a single organisation that, that, will, that will be able to solve this issue. It needs to be a joined-up approach by a number of organisations to use their expertise and resources and, and powers uh, to collaboratively in an attempt to disrupt this trade. When I first became involved, and particularly the, when we were discussing the, is it appropriate for SSPCA to be authorised to enforce the council's powers in relation to people importing dogs, my first concern, is this just a matter of regulation and paperwork? That's what I thought this issue may be. The more I looked into it, the more I found that there is a serious welfare uh, or there's serious welfare issues throughout. And much of the industry, particularly the unlicensed or unregulated industry, because of the drive for profit, is built on a foundation of compromising the welfare from the very start to the very end. So in terms of the Scottish SPCA and, and its statutory responsibility to enforce the Animal Health and Welfare Act, then I think that uh, it is entirely uh, appropriate that the, the SSPCA uh, are, are addressing that on that footing and trying to get as many organisations to buy into this as we can. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of the councils, because there's so many councils, some are better than others and some really haven't addressed the problem at all. Uh, but I'm sure as, as people become aware of the issue, particularly the large amounts of money involved, the serious amount of suffering, and the fact that organised crime has identified this as an avenue for exploitation, then people will be forced to set up. The, 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 perhaps people that have been slow to pick up, they will be forced to pick up on this and, and, and address it, just because of the, the amount of areas that it's, that it's now it's, eating it's, into. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the profit of the dogs now. People up until recently were selling dogs and making money and organised criminals were selling money. They're now using the puppy industry as a means to launder conventional criminality, the profits from conventional criminality. So they're, they're justifying having large sums of money through illicit dog dealing when in actual fact it comes from other more conventional criminality drugs or, or whatever. And that's why we're working so close with the police, their intervention strategy and whatever, because it does affect communities uh, not and not just the animals. And I suppose with um, 
have greater public awareness, you know, it, it will eventually that there will be a, an absolute impetus put into agencies coming together to, to solve it. Um, yes. The more it's talked about, and the more publicity it gets. The consumer's got yeah. a big part to play in yeah. this. The public have got they've got to be. Whilst you have we're striving to get responsible breeders, mm -hmm. they should be responsible buyers. Yeah. And not look to, to save a few quid by mm -hmm. buying a, a puppy in a car park and yeah. as that eleven o'clock on a Saturday night yeah. because that, you wouldn't buy any other consumable item or you wouldn't buy your fridge freezer in in that in those scenarios. So why would you think of buying an animal that you're going to have for 15, 20 years in those circumstances and then be surprised when something goes wrong? Sure. Just one other wee, just one other thing. I, I was curious about. You mentioned the. Um, the, the, the massive puppy farms in, in, in Ireland and, um, you know, thousand breeding bitches, etc. And given that you know about those, I mean, what happens? Do, do the authorities go in and close them down or, you know, do, do they get closed down and then they just reopen again? Many of them are licensed. So many of them, and many of them have had, uh, and, and that's obviously an issue for Southern Ireland and their authorities uh -huh, and their local sure. councils. And uh -huh. but we we're working to provide the information from our end to say mm. these pups are coming over. We know that that industry is willing. Some of them are willing to break the law and and breach the regulations in terms of microchipping. So pups that come from Southern Ireland and, and into the illegal trade are not microchipped, and that's specifically to avoid traceability back to Southern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So they're not make so these these people that are licensed are, and we're passing that information back mm -hmm. to Southern Ireland so the authorities in Southern can Ireland can address that. Mm -hmm. And they are dealing with that at the moment. Oh, but it, it is taking them time to 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 like ourselves and like England and like Wales it, to address the problem and then come up with strategy as to so it's sure. a developing issue there sure. as well. Okay, thank you. Angus? Yeah, thanks. Uh, just following on from Rona Mackay's uh, last point there, have you looked at licensing regimes in other parts of Europe and is there any good practice out there that the Scottish Government could consider? I think that's a, yeah, another really interesting, we haven't uh, uh, as yet looked at other European countries. I know, that, I know the regime in Southern Ireland and Southern Ireland I think have got a lot of work to do and are in a similar position to ourselves, if not worse, in, in terms of how their councils license, regulate, follow up inspection. That is perhaps an area that we could take on board and, and, and speak with or, or look at how other countries in Europe deal with this issue. But what is interesting is the prices that these pups are commanding, the £2,500 for a French bulldog, doesn't appear to be, these prices are not being met in places like Germany, France, Belgium. It seems to be very much a UK. We're prepared to pay these prices for some reason. So, you know, they don't have that consumer end problem that we have. Some people are prepared to pay these prices. I, I get my border colleagues free from the LMS. <laughs> and good on you. For, yeah, I think that's a sensible way to, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rafferty, in your opening statement, you talked about current microchipping practice and posed some questions about which database details should be registered on the microchip and the regulation of those who carry out microchipping. How would you answer these, those questions if you were designing a new system? Yeah, I think it does need, definitely needs to be looked at. Uh, and now in each country in the UK and Southern Ireland, it is it is. It is a statutory legal requirement to microchip dogs. What I would say is, in each country, they're all having their own problems in, in terms of people picking up and, and adopting this procedure. The, the problem in Scotland, if we can stick to Scotland at the moment, is, in principle, I think it's a, a really good idea, the traceability of animals back to where they came, not only just in respect to the, any breeding, but also the, the, the more obvious where pets get lost or need to be returned to their, to, to their owners. The difficulty that we have in Scotland is you can microchip an animal by buying the microchip off the internet. You can implant the chip by someone who's, uh, who's got the self-approved and you can put it on any one, that, or any, uh, one of a number of databases. Or actually, what they, uh, a lot of people are doing that are involved in more illicit, they microchip them and then don't register them. So when, they, when the dogs move or come through Cairn uh, Ryan or through the ports, they scan, they have a chip, and everyone thinks that that's as far as, yeah, it's got a chip, it must be legal. So at the moment, we've got too many databases 
We need to, we need to consolidate that or, or restrict it, ideally to one. Southern Ireland have got two. So uh, we, we need to look at the amount of organisations where you can register the chip, and then we need to see some more robust enforcement to get the message across that actually this is a legal requirement and there can be penalties if you don't comply with the law in conjunction with education and perhaps facilitating people to get their uh, dogs microchipped by perhaps SSPCA or Dogs Trust, making it m more available to people that, that, that have got dogs and perhaps wouldn't get them chipped and make it more easy for them to get them chipped. I'll supplement to that. When I took my dog to the vet about a year ago, uh, the, first, the question he asked me said, Morris, um, you've got to have your dog chipped because there's a regulations coming in. Yes. What enforcement of pressure has been putting on the veterinary surgeries and the veterinary surgeons professionally to actually in, enforce that? Well, I, 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 I think it should be the responsibility of the owner or the breeder. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps to try and squeeze that onto the vets may not be the right approach. Uh, is the response not the response? Uh, uh, I think that's a bit like you taking your car for an MOT mm -hmm. and the person saying to you, you need to get your car MOT'd and then going back to the company and saying, you should be making sure. It's the responsibility of the person who has the animal or breeding the dogs, I think, that should have the responsibility. And vets and all these other try to promote that and yeah. make it easier. So sorry. So, so there's no info. So there's, you see no way of getting the vets to actually enforce be told, that. No, by I, local I, I think that you know maybe it needs more exploration or, or whatever. But I, I, I would think, and I wasn't I'm prepared for that question. But I could see difficulties in that, okay. uh, particularly with the veterinary profession. And, and you know, you, you want people to take their dogs to the vet. Mm -hmm. and encourage people to take their dogs to the vet for well, and you don't want to have a situation perhaps where people are reluctant to take them for the vet because they would fear that they may be reported or there could mm -hmm. be enforcement or, or whatever. So I would, I would say perhaps for consideration, but at the moment I, th I, I think that's perhaps got, got difficulties attached to it. I'm glad to say I did have a microchip, so that was fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I should think so too. Uh, Emma Harper? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, many questions have been asked already, and that's great, because uh, I have a, a declare an interest because I've been working on illegal trafficking and animal welfare issues. I am on the animal welfare cross-party group, so, and I have been working directly with Mark Rafferty and Eileen Bryant because I happen to look after the Port of Cairn Ryan in the South Scotland constituency as well. So I'm interested in pursuing like further licensing because... The work that we've done is contact national trade and standards to look at maybe some kind of across all 32 councils, maybe standardising the approach to licensing so that whether you've got five dogs, five, uh, 50 dogs or 500 dogs, maybe the standardised cost would cover that. Currently in Dumfries and Galloway, it's £175 to get a breeder's licence um, and that's half the cost of one pup if we're talking about, you know, designer dogs. So what would your thoughts be on, you know, COSLA engaging, trading standards engaging, so we've got a standard approach across Scotland? I, I think that's a really good idea. And, and I think that the, the COSLA and the councils are key to, to if we are going to solve or have of, of an impact on this issue, then the, the councils have to be engaged at this level. And there has to be a consistency within the councils and a realistic expectation as to what they can do based upon the cost of, of doing what they have to, or what it is to do. And £175 for a, for a licence for a, an establishment where you can make many hundreds of thousands of pounds, to me, seems to be a bit out of kilter. So I, I would certainly welcome that. Okay, I've just got another supplementary about uh, vets across Scotland as well. Um, should they be tracking the number of puppies that are coming in that maybe have parvo parvovirus or um, some kind of other disease? M maybe should they be asking, where did you get that dog? And then tracking the treatment of the dog and whether they survived or whether they were euthanized. Because in addition to just spending £500 on a brand new puppy that you've never seen with its mother, 
uh, which is actually the best practice, should the vets maybe be helping by asking the questions as well? I would say that we do get a buy-in from vets, and many vets do contact us right up to the, I've got Joe Blogs bringing 300 pups into me every month to get vaccinated. I suspect they're coming from intensive regimes and this person is operating a puppy dealing business to instances where the, the, the pups do have uh, parvovirus. I think the difficulty for, for some vets is that, uh, one, obviously the, 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 their responsibility to look after the animal and the confidentiality of their client based upon sometimes just because a dog has parvovirus doesn't mean to say it's come from an intensive regime. Parvovirus is a, is a condition that any dog can get, any pup can get. That's why we vaccinate our dogs against parvovirus. It just is a particular issue or is a particular risk in intensive regimes and pups that have been bred intensively because they've been removed, often removed from their mothers and not inoculated are susceptible to parvovirus. So I think the education, meeting with vets and encouraging vets to come forward and and give us their suspicions and whatever would be welcomed. And, and on a vast amount of occasions, vets do do that. And if we're going to educate vets, we should be educating the public as well. Most and definitely. if we did a public um, information campaign, because I know um, the government is looking at research right now about what motivates people to buy a dog and from Gumtree or uh, Facebook. And I know Facebook and Gumtree have a policy where they don't endorse the sale of animals but how do they enforce that? Because we know it's happening. And, uh, you know, if there was a public information campaign, should it be television, radio, papers? How, how would you suggest we take that forward and who would be the audience? Well, actually, Emma, I think all of it. I think it's all got to uh, come together. I, I would like to see it in schools. I would like to see it, as I said, somewhere into the curriculum that we're actually educating children because children will educate their parents they they will help their parents choose where a puppy comes from and if you can get it into children not to buy you know from a car park go and see the mum do that i think the most important thing is getting it into the children but we've got to do it always we've got to hit absolutely everywhere with it uh, and i think yes the campaign should be everywhere can I add in an attempt to, to gather the information that the public want or need or would assist? The Scottish SPCA are working with Edinburgh University at the moment to do studies into the puppies and the puppy trade, what motivates a person to buy, why they buy from particular people, why they buy at particular times, as well as the health of pups from... Uh, regime from intensive breeding regimes so we've identified so many people that have bought pups from intensive regimes we've also looked at people that have not bought or bought pups that are not from intensive regimes and we're looking at all that or looking to, to, to look at that data to see is there health issues what are the health issues how often what's the likelihood if you buy a pup from an intensive regime how many times are you likely to buy the vet uh, visit the vet what uh, and also the, the behavioral issues does your Pup bite? Is it is it unsocial? Is it difficult to train? So all this information is going to come, and I think we're going to get a result on that this year. So this information is going to be available, and that's the kind of inf information I think that the public would need to make an informed choice on what they're buying. Can I ask one more supplementary? Briefly, it's about just to clarify about HMRC. Do they have a special task force that are looking at um, you yes. know people selling dogs but they're not declaring the the uh. income? Yes, and uh, at the risk of, of speaking on behalf of HMRC, I'll make it clear I'm not speaking on behalf of HMRC. HMRC have played a part in Operation Delphin, and they are playing a significant part in Operation Delphin. People that are selling pups and trading pups and making an income from pups are uh, liable for tax, the same as anyone else for any other income. HMRC are looking at that and looking at the puppy trade and have launched a task force specifically to identify these people. My understanding is that they are making significant inroads in, in, res in respect of people that are not paying uh, income tax and VAT, and we're talking many hundreds of thousands of pounds for individuals. I understand it may be as much as 500,000 pounds for single individual people. Uh, that, that that haven't paid that's income tax that hasn't been paid as well as VAT. So they are they are making a significant 
impact on the trade and 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 people are beginning to learn if you if you do run a business and you are you selling pups and making an income you are liable for the tax and the VAT if it reaches up to a threshold and I would really welcome and continue to uh, uh, rely on the support of HMRC in that respect but they're working albeit under the umbrella of Operation Delphin, obviously in isolation and under their own guidelines. And, 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 but it's extremely helpful, the work that they've been doing. OK, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Um, thank you very much for today. I think one thing that I feel around public awareness, if it's supposed to be fashionable and something that you would want to aspire to as a celebrity, when you shine a light on some of these practices, I think there can be a reaction to that, that that sense of shock you can remember it in the fur trade or whatever, mm -hmm. that actually the people who were um, role models to others of what an, an aspirational consumer good was became also advocates for saying that's not acceptable. So I think what you've done today in shining a light on, on the trade does in itself contribute to, to that idea. This is not something that people want to be associated with. So I kind of thank you very much indeed um, for coming along today. We have to think about how we want to take the petition forward. I think we do want to take it forward. I think there's a whole number of people that we can um, contact. I think we'd also want to speak to the Scottish Government um, on the point that Morris makes, perhaps asking the British Veterinary Association what their views are on that balance between the responsibility to the welfare of the animal and the broader questions. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's come out very strongly has been around local authorities. So maybe getting a view from them. Just to see what the government uh, sort of guidelines are uh, to to local councils. So it seems it was raised earlier on. That there's not a, a consistency mm -hmm. across all councils um, around cost of licensing, uh, around you know, how we deal with with uh, the illegal trade. So I'm quite mm -hmm. interested to hear what the government yeah. had to say about that. Okay. So, so the answer is the because um, ferry companies, Police Scotland, trading standards, port authorities. Um, dogs Trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, it must all, be a lot of interested stakeholders. Yeah, all I think, the number yeah. of yeah. animal welfare organisations yeah. who might have yeah. a view. I mean, the cross party group will. Do we know one is be sensible to also include the HMRC in that? Yes. I think it is. Yeah. yeah. It'd be an interesting one. And perhaps specifically to write to Dumfries and Galloway to. Yeah. Because they've clearly been trying no, 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 to yeah. address this question and probably a lot further forward than other um, local authorities. Is there anything else? Could I perhaps add, I'm really sorry, is it, can I add a final point Surely. that I haven't had? One of the issues that, that, that we are finding is difficult, we have a prosecution uh, where we have seized 100 dogs at the moment in, in relation to just one, one case. We've had these dogs now for approaching 18 months in our care. The cost of looking after these dogs is in excess of £100,000, way in advance of that. It's also, I would argue, not in the interest of the pup to take a pup in, in, into the care and keep it in institutionalised kennels, albeit how good they are for, for a, in those formative years. There isn't a system at the, or there is difficulty for us to... to, to have any other way to deal with these pups other than hold them until the conclusion of the case. There is uh, legislation uh, in various other pieces, like, like for instance, if it's cattle or sheep or agricultural animals, that these animals can be disposed of, sold or whatever, moved on to a better circumstance than held in limbo. Unfortunately, one of the main issues for consideration at the moment is, one, if you do seize these animals, the cost, but also is it in the interest of the animals to keep them for nearly two years in kennels waiting on a result of a court case? Mm -hmm. So that's one area. So this may be something, I mean, with, with who the, the, the clerks can advise us and who we would be speaking to, would it be the Justice Secretary or um, on the court side to ask their view on that? But that makes perfect sense if they're... If the prosecutions are being delayed, the impact on the welfare of the of the animal is 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 detrimental. They have to be rehomed. You're yeah. rehoming an animal that's come from an intensive regime that's then been held in kennels for two years. What is that animal like at the end of that period to go then into a family? Uh, so yeah. Okay. Well, I think there's a whole range of organisations and interested groups that we would want to to contact and and uh, so perhaps. 
I think we'd have to defer consideration until they've had that fact. Yes, I, think so. I don't think we can yeah. take an honest approach on this until that's done. Yeah. Um, so I think we can do that and obviously keep in mind that we are looking for this information around mm. you know, what, what the balance of provision is going to be by the Scottish Government. Um, and we can come back to the committee after the fact finding uh, visits taking place, but we wouldn't we, that wouldn't we wouldn't envisage that being too far away, but possibly beginning with a new parliamentary session. I was wondering, um, convener, in in the meantime, um, if there was to be a decision with regard to the split between the provision of insulin pumps and CGM devices. If we could get an early indication of that, perhaps before the site visit, uh, before a fact-finding visit, yes, um, it would be helpful for us when we do take further evidence. Yeah, yeah. If perhaps we can contact the Scottish Government and and highlight to them that we are having this continued work. We're going to do a bit of, you know, the fact-finding visits were said, but any information around progress and making that decision would help and inform that. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm a cross-party group for uh, diabetes, and I think what well, we kind of further from what uh, what Angus is saying is this, this ten million pounds. Um, how that's going to be split mm. is actually becomes key. Yeah. Uh, and, how, and what that will actually how, how far that will spread. Yes. Um, so we'll, be well, and it's always that balanced decision between maximise impact, yeah. spreading it so thinly that yeah. you know people don't really get the benefit either way. Mm. Okay, that's very helpful. If we can then move on to the final petition on the agenda, it's petition 1631 by Ma Maureen McVeigh on child welfare hearings. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions received. Members will see that we've been provided an example of the pro forma used to record information in child hearings. The Children and Young People's Commissioner is supportive of the petition. The Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and the Scottish Government have both noted that the Scottish Civil Justice Council is looking at the issue of case management in family cases. They've also noted that the petition would have resource and cost implications. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I, mean, I think while they have said, and there's quite a lot of stuff has come through here that mm -hmm. there are cost and um, resource and cost implications, but they don't say what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be quite, I mean, if it's a bit of resource implication, if it's a massive one, I would have thought with modern technology, less so. Yeah. But if the fundamental thing is that the petitioner feels that when they go from one hearing to the next, the full mm -hmm. information on what has happened up yes. to date is not yeah. being provided, that's quite important. Yes. But you don't want to make it cumbersome or complex. And I think mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, the, from the pre-hearing panel, their pro form is quite interesting mm -hmm. um, in the way in which they deal, they deal with that, and that presumably goes into notes and they have the information for the next hearing, because one of the issues in the hearing system is not necessarily having the same panel members in front of you um, for every case. So That's right. I, don't I think know. the thing about forms like that, which are used in uh, children's hearings as well, it depends how well they're filled in and who's filling them in. Whereas if it was being recorded, that's yes. a more accurate yes. uh, you know, um, picture of, of, of events. And I think it'd be important to find out if we can get an idea of, of what the cost would be to move to digital recording. Um, because I don't think you can really compare it to the, the paper template that we have here. Um, so I think that would be key. We need to ask them for that. Um, I suppose it, you may, I mean, as somebody who has been a panel member, presumably if you get that kind of form mm. in your papers, that is something you would read. Mm -hmm. Realistically, if you had a digital recording of a hearing, there mm -hmm. would still need to be a summary of it somewhere. Mm -hmm. because, I mean, realistically, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the child welfare hearing uh -huh. and the panel are, are comparable, and I don't think, that, I understand yeah. they're not both the same thing. Yeah. I'm just thinking in practical terms of somebody involved in that mm -hmm. kind of work. Would you sit through a whole digital hearing or I think it would be useful, to be useful if there wasn't enough information on the form which often there isn't mm -hmm. um, and, and as I say it depends who, who's filling it in and what information they want to give so if you still had questions and it, it wasn't clear you know from what was being said in the form a digital recording would be used as backup mm -hmm. um, I just I mean I just think it, in this day and age it, it would be the way to go um, but again we need to find out what the cost implications are and mm -hmm. get more information on it Mm -hmm. um, because, but you know, pa paper forms can get lost or you know mislaid. So okay. I think it'd be a more secure way of doing it. So if, if we can um, agree to write the Scottish government um, 
for more information about the cost implications that such a move would be, and, and if there are other things that you think would be a problem, do they have a view on using the pro forma template? Um, and other information we get from elsewhere? It has been suggested we write to the Family, Family Law, Law Committee, Committee of the Scottish Civil Justice yes. Council, perhaps. I think that's important, yeah. 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 Because there may be something from that perspective that we are missing here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in that case, we, we are recognising still that there are issues here that we would want to address to, in order to address the, the concerns the petitioner has highlighted. Um, and that, again, will be one that we would want to come back to. Um, with the, the consideration of that final petition, we've now um, finished the agenda in public, so can I close this meeting?